So welcome to Thriving and Breast Cancer, what we've learned from the Pathways study. This is the first in our Pathways Breast Cancer study free webinar series. I am Katherine Thompson. I am the Science and Survivorship Program Director for Zero Breast Cancer, and we are one of the collaborating organizations on the Pathways study. Um, I am on Ohlone lands, and Zero Breast Cancer offices are on Miwok coastal lands. Um, we at Zero Breast Cancer got started more than 25 years ago by breast cancer survivors who were focused on the many things that we can control that impact our risk of getting cancer and also on the health and quality of our lives after a breast cancer diagnosis. Now, there are some things that we can do on our own that we can um, that can help to improve our lives and to help to improve our health and wellness. And then there are other things that require us to work together to address social problems, to get at the unfair practices and unjust conditions that weaken the, un, the specific um, problems that cause health problems for uh, Americans. So at Zero Breast Cancer, we try to um, address both um, things that we can do as individuals, as well as at um, the neighborhood and a societal level. Um, please sign up for our occasional emails to learn about our English and Spanish language campaigns, including our survivorship fact sheets, which we have developed based on our collaboration with the Pathways Research um, folks and our Pathways community advisors, um, the survivors that are part of the Pathways study. Um, the links are in the chat. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. There's a lot more information on our website about the folks and that will also be in the chat. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce everyone now, and then um, as each person comes up, you'll um, get to hear from them. So starting out with Dr. Larry Cushy, he's the Director of Scientific Policy at Kaiser Permanente Northern California Division of Research. Larry is a nutritional and cancer epidemiologist, and he is the father of the Pathways study, which he began as an investigator-initiated research grant back in 2004, is it, Larry? Um, then we have Dr. Isaac Ergus, who's a staff scientist at Kaiser Permanente Northern California Division of Research, where he explores dietary lifestyle and behavioral risk factors for breast and bladder cancer. Isaac got his PhD in epidemiology, and he also has an MFA in film and television. Ijimaka Anyeni Fugamali is a data reporting and analytics consultant at Kaiser Permanente Northern California Division of Research. Ijimaka works work focuses on body composition, cancer outcomes, and surgical complications, and she has her master's in public health. And Song, Dr. Song Yao is a professor in the Department of Cancer Prevention and Control at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center, and he's also director of molecular epidemiology. His research area is in molecular and genetic epidemiology, seeking to understand how characteristics contribute to cancer disparities. So Larry, would you please share your slides and go ahead and right. start. Sure. Uh yeah, so thanks so much, uh, um, Catherine, for the introduction that's, and uh, uh, for hosting this. You, uh, I'd like to thank Zero Breast Cancer and um, uh, for being the host for these uh, presentations. I'll just give a brief overview of the Pathways study uh, and sort of set the table for the more specific presentations uh, that are uh, that will follow from the three great colleagues who have been working with us. Uh, so the pathway study, anyway, uh, I'll give you a brief description. It's supported 
Institute. These are some of the grant numbers, uh, if anyone cares about that. At the very bit, bottom of the slide, you'll see are the participating core institutions. But I'll start by basically taking this quote from a report from the American Cancer Society on Nutrition and Physical Activity Guidelines for Cancer Survivors uh, from 2012. They do have an updated report uh, published in uh, 2022, uh, uh, but, um, but this quote wasn't in the updated report. So in any case, uh, after receiving a diagnosis of cancer, survivors soon find that there are few clear answers to even the simplest questions, such as, should I change what I eat? Should I exercise more? Should I gain or lose weight? Dietary supplements. So cancer survivors receive a wide range of advice from many sources about foods they should eat, foods they should avoid, how they should exercise, what types of supplements they should take, if any. And unfortunately, this advice is often inconsistent and not supported by data. And so given this background and this reality, and this has been uh, the situation for many, many years preceding the uh, 2012 publication of this report. And in recent years, the Pathways study and other studies have started to fill in some of this uh, missing gaps in knowledge. <clears throat> and this was really the rationale for why we wanted to create the Pathways study. So when we were thinking about the Pathways study, we were really thinking about hoping to create a cohort study looking at women with breast cancer and to really focus on the breast cancer experience and to really be the premier uh, observational study in this area <laughs> to really develop the knowledge that could help answer the types of questions that were on the previous slide, uh, but also a wide variety of other factors uh, that may really uh, help to uh, improve the lives of women who are diagnosed with breast cancer. And so in doing so, we're in the process, we have been creating a, a research project as well as a resource that can exam, examine factors on multiple levels on a comprehensive integrated platform. And by partnering with an organization like Zero uh, Forums like the one today, we really hope to gain the perspectives of women with breast cancer, breast care advocates, uh, breast cancer advocates, caregivers, and clinicians. And so, we have, in fact, I think, uh, been, I guess, not so modest, but uh, I think we are the premier prospective cohort study of women with breast cancer. Um, we've enrolled a, a large 4,500 women and diverse cohort of study participants of women who were diagnosed with breast cancer in Kaiser Permanente, Northern California. We started enrollment in January 2006 and ended in May 2013, and we have been following this group of 4,500 women since. And we've collected information on multiple level factors through interviews and surveys. Uh, and thank you so much for the uh, people who are on this uh, uh, forum uh, who are actually study participants for contributing. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, on various lifestyle factors, the uh, first couple of presentations will focus specifically on uh, diet uh, and diet related factors. Uh, but we've collected information on a number of other uh, factors through these interviews that are not readily captured otherwise. We've collected blood and saliva samples, uh, uh, and the blood samples have been used in, as you will see, as, as one example, looking at the blood levels of vitamin D and how that may relate to. And because all these, all, everyone who's participated are, were diagnosed and members of Kaiser Permanente, you know, we have ability to link to Kaiser Permanente electronic healthcare records and medical records to pull information, much more detail on diagnosis, treatment, et cetera. Uh, and, and in addition, we are linking to area level databases, census data, data and others to really try and see how sort of the, the neighborhood re impacts um, all these various factors and how they impact breast cancer outcomes. And, and of course, we're continuing to follow the study population, as, as, as I noted. And so, uh, just so people generally know, people were invited to join the pathway study if they were diagnosed with breast cancer, age 21 or older at diagnosis, um, and diagnosed in Kaiser, Northern California, and did not have a personal history of cancer other than non-melanoma skin cancer. Uh, and 
for practical reasons, you know, with it lived within a reasonable distance of our field staff at the time that we conducted our baseline interviews. So this gives you an idea of the type of uh, of study population, those age uh, distributions, and as you can see, you know, if you break it out into uh, people uh, less than 50, 50 to 59, 60, 69, and 70 plus. Uh, this is the general distribution of uh, <clears throat> how people who are enrolled into the pathways study actually, this is the, uh, on the right-hand side are the people who were potentially eligible to be recruited into the pathways study. And so you can, uh, but ended up not enrolling. And you can see there are slight differences. The pathway study women are shifted to slightly younger ages, but not dramatically so. Uh, we didn't contact necessarily all the 6,600 women, you know, who, who and were not enrolled in the pathway study, but uh, but gives you an idea of how that looks. Um, these are uh, stage of diagnosis for breast cancer. We included all women. We invited all women with uh, invasive breast cancer, and you can see that in general, uh, the distributions are not too different uh, between those who are potentially eligible and uh, and were not enrolled in the study, uh, although there's a slight stage shift to earlier stages, more stage one and less stage four. <clears throat> this is uh, by race ethnicity, and you can see that the uh, uh, the pathway study enrolled women compared with those who were not enrolled, uh, a somewhat higher proportion of white women, which is reflected primarily in the Asian and African-American populations here. The purple is the Asian, the green is the African-American, uh, uh, slightly somewhat lower uh, in the pathway study cohort, but still the pathway study is a multi-ethnic, you know, diverse uh, cohort. Uh, so it gives you some idea of some of that. From a study participant perspective, we've conducted you know, surveys, uh, interviews, and so thank you again if you're part of the study for participating in these. Uh, you know, women were diagnosed with breast cancer, and then soon thereafter, we we invited people to participate in the study. And our baseline questionnaire uh, and interview was conducted about two months after diagnosis. We did a follow up at six months after. Uh, second follow-up about a year later, a third follow-up three years later, fourth follow-up 48, you know, four years later, then a couple years after that, another follow-up, and we're continuing to follow up women. These percentages are the percent of people who are eligible to participate in that follow-up. And you can see some are about two-thirds, and some are more closer to 90% in terms of participation. And that's primarily because we measures, which we ask people to participate to fill in for the lower participation rates. And, and uh, we appreciate the fact that those questionnaires are not the most user-friendly anyway. Uh, uh, so in any case, this is uh, uh, how, from a study participant perspective, we have been in touch with you. Of course, we've been in touch in other ways as well, but uh, uh, thank you so much for contributing these data. Uh, and these are you know additional information that we've collected. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we collected blood spe specimens and saliva samples at baseline or around baseline and uh, the vitamin D results will be based on, on these blood samples. So the fact that, as I mentioned, your, uh, people were part of KP that really allowed you to uh, obtain information from electronic health records that uh, otherwise would not be readily as easily obtained, uh, details of cancer diagnosis and treatment. Uh, identifying various conditions such as recurrence of breast cancer, you know, other comorbid conditions or outcomes like cardiovascular disease or diabetes or bone health, uh, some of which may be touched on in the presentations coming up. Uh, prescription medication use, laboratory test results, et cetera, and also obtain uh, sur surgical specimens to look at tumor characteristics, for example. Uh, and I wanted to just do a slightly deeper dive into the neighborhood area. Uh, again, another quote from David Williams uh, from a PBS documentary on unnatural causes and that place matters. When we think about health, we usually think about healthcare and access to healthcare and the quality of care. But what research clearly shows is that health is embedded in the larger conditions in which we live and work. 
And sometimes we naively think of improving health by simply changing behaviors, but the choices of individuals are often limited by the environments in which they live. And so this is one of the reasons that we really felt that it was important to try and capture that as well. And so we really have co collected information on uh, a variety of factors uh, through um, uh, linkage to census data and other area level databases, including the Cal and virus and virus screen where we'll be uh, examining the impacts of uh, pollutants. Um, <clears throat> so, so these are this is a relatively unique aspect overall uh, with uh, our study compared with many others of the cancer survivors. Uh, so, overall, I'll just say this is a this is a framework that was really built in the con uh, put together in the context of health disparities research, but it really applies to what we're doing as well. We're really looking at these biological factors. Uh, you know, such as the vitamin D that you hear about. Uh, we've uh, done genome-wide assays as well. Um, uh, the study participants in the cohort uh, could look at molecular subtypes. Sorry, I should have added that. Uh, uh, the lifestyle factors like diet, which we will hear about, uh, you know, and other factors at the level. Uh, the built environment and social environment. I talked about linkage to KP electronic health records, you know, so part of that is perhaps on an individual level, but there are also healthcare system related factors like distance to uh, treatment facilities, et cetera. Uh, and so, and ultimately all this takes place in some policy and uh, environment in which uh, uh, things like access to healthcare, et cetera, um, may, be, uh, may vary. So. So ultimately, this uh, we believe all these factors come to play in uh, impacting breast cancer outcomes. So these are the main institutions that are uh, really supporting uh, the ongoing work in the pathway study and these slide. But of course, KP Northern California, where I reside and many of my colleagues reside, uh, <clears throat> including two of the other speakers, Roswell Park Com Comprehensive Cancer Center, where uh, Dr. Yao will be presenting from, and they really house our biorepository for the blood specimens, et cetera. Uh, UC Davis is involved in terms of linkage to statewide healthcare data uh, for people who have left the Kaiser Health Plan. Uh, UCSF, uh, of course, with the neighborhood and social and contextual factors, and as I mentioned, zero breast cancer without which forms such as this really can't, couldn't occur. Uh, this has been a major resource. I mentioned, you know, sort of a perspective of being kind of a premier breast cancer prospective cohort study. And these are some of the institutions, people who are working with us, uh, who we're collaborating with on various grants and analyses, just to give an idea. Uh, and ultimately, you know, the pathway study really would not be possible without the many people who've contributed over the years since 2004, as when we were first funded, September 2004. Uh, the support of the KP research and healthcare community, that's really been vital to making the success, of course, the funding support, but most of all, you know, the thousands of study participants who've really generously contributed their time, their experience and the information so that others can really benefit from the knowledge that we generate from the Pathways study. So uh, let me turn it over to, I think Isaac is next. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Larry. Um, go ahead, Isaac. Uh, let's see, can you see my slides? Great, wonderful. Uh, hello, everybody, I'm Isaac Ergus. Uh, I'm a staff scientist uh, at the Division of Research, and I'm so happy to be here to talk with you today about dietary patterns and breast cancer survival. So yeah, so just to um, say that there are you know many ways in which we can approach diet and think about um, diet, uh, including looking at individual nutrients. Uh, we can look at specific foods, and we can look at dietary patterns, the overall dietary intake, and how these different uh, elements impact health outcomes. And so just to acknowledge that each of these areas uh, are very important in our understanding of how. Um, these relationships work, but today I'll be talking specifically about dietary patterns. Uh, so what are dietary patterns? Dietary patterns are 
the quantities, proportions, variety, or combination of different foods, drinks, and nutrients and diets, and the frequency with which they are consumed. So basically, it's the totality of everything that we take in in terms of our diet. And each of our dietary patterns are unique. So what's great about a dietary pattern is we can measure how similar one's dietary pattern is uh, to a predetermined dietary pattern by creating an index score. So for example, on the left here, you have the DASH diet or the dietary approaches to stop hypertension which is a dietary pattern that was introduced in the 90s to help uh, manage hypertension. And um, here you can see on the left, it encourages certain food items. And on the right, it discourages other kinds of food items, including sodium and fatty meats and things like that. So what we can do is we can look at uh, a person's individual uh, dietary intake and reward them for uh, eating more of the encouraged foods and then take away points for eating more of the discouraged foods. And we could do this with each of the individual food groups. And then we can sum them up and create an overall DASH score. And so what this DASH score tells us is how similar a person's diet is to this DASH dietary pattern. And uh, this is what we'll be looking at. So why use a diet index score? Well, they help to inform and validate dietary guidelines for institutions such as like the American Cancer Society, the American Institute for Cancer Research, as well as others. And they can help us assess diet quality. And what I mean by diet quality is I mean how healthy a diet is. So if we're looking at a, diet, a dietary pattern that we presume is a healthy diet, then in terms of how similar a person's diet is to that pattern, we could say that they are eating a healthier diet. So the question that we are concerned with on pathways in, in, this, in regard to dietary patterns is, does diet quality, does the health of one's diet in terms of how healthy a diet is matter when it comes to breast cancer outcomes? And there are two approaches that we can think about this. The first is at diagnosis. So what's a person's diet at the time of their diagnosis? What is the, the diet that they bring into their breast cancer experience and how does that impact breast cancer outcomes? The other way we could think about it is, well, now that I've been diagnosed with breast cancer, what happens if I change my diet? So dietary, uh, measuring diet after diagnosis and what its impact is on breast cancer outcomes. So first, let me start with talking about um, diet at diagnosis. So to help answer this question, we looked at four dietary quality indices that we believe are co uh, consistent with healthy eating recommendations. We looked at the American Cancer Society Nutrition Guidelines, which is put forth by the American Cancer so Society uh, for Cancer Prevention. We looked at the Mediterranean diet, which many of you may have heard of, which emphasizes foods, uh, in the traditions of the countries of the Mediterranean, like Crete and Greece. Uh, we looked at the, uh, the DASH diet, which we just discussed, as well as the healthy eating index, which is uh, based on uh, general healthy eating guidelines, uh, which are set forth by USDA and Health and Human Services uh, every five years. So these are the four that we looked at. And as you can see from this table, uh, they, they are unique. Each, each index is unique. Uh, they each have different kinds of scoring and they each reward different kinds of foods and they take away point, they discourage other kinds of foods, but there's also some similarities. So for example, we see fruits and vegetable intake across all the different uh, indices. However, for the American Cancer Society um, index, you can see that they emphasize variety. So uh, where the other indices don't really think of, uh, you know, don't really count a variety as, um, as part of the point totals, uh, ACS does. So there's some, you know, nuanced differences between each of these indices. So we wanted to ask, is there an association between diet quality at or around the time of diagnosis and breast cancer outcomes? And the breast cancer outcomes we looked at were breast cancer recurrence, breast cancer specific death, so death due to breast cancer, non-breast cancer specific deaths, so deaths not having to do with breast cancer, as well as uh, deaths due to all causes. And here's what we found. We found that diet quality around diagnosis, at or around diagnosis, was associated with all cause and non-breast cancer specific mortality. So what you see here are hazard ratios that are comparing the highest quintile, so the top 20%, of people who were most similar to each of these dietary indices 
to the lowest quintile, the lowest 20%, who were the, the, the furthest from uh, these dietary indices. And so when we look at all-cause mortality, we can see that all of them really uh, you know, have some sort of um, advantage to following this diet, um, that they're each protective against all-cause mortality, though the only one that was statistically significant and offered a 27% reduced risk when comparing the folks at the top uh, who are most similar to ACS to the folks at the bottom who are least similar to ACS, um, there was a 27% uh, reduced risk of all-cause mortality. And then um, over here with non-breast cancer specific mortality, we also saw associations with some of, some of the other indices, but the standout here was really the DASH diet um, that offered a 45% reduced risk when comparing the top quintile to the lowest. And just to add that all of these indices, except for the Mediterranean diet, were statistically significant for test for trend, uh, basically meaning that the more, the more similar your diet was to one of these indices, the more likely you were to have a better outcome. And then finally, just to say also that we did, in this analysis, we did not see any associations between diet quality and recurrence of breast cancer or breast cancer specific mortality. So breast cancer specific outcomes. And uh, maybe later in the Q and A, if we have more time, we can speculate a little bit as to why that might be. So coming back to this question of does diet quality matter when it comes to breast cancer outcomes? We talked about the diet at diagnosis. Now, what about after diagnosis? What about changing our diet? So to help answer this question, we, we introduced another index called the Healthy Plant-Based Dietary Index, which discourages intake from animal, all animal sources and any unhealthy food sources. So here you can see it ranges from 17 to 85, the points, and it encourages all the healthy type plants. So whole fruits, whole grains, legumes, but discourages any meat sources as well as unhealthy vet, uh, plant sources such as refined grains uh, or sweets. And we wanted to look at this index in conjunction and in combination with two other risk factors, physical activity and smoking. And we wanted to look at these individually with their impact on, for their impact on all cause mortality, but as well as we want to look at them in combination with each other. So what is the impact of, of these things together? And so how did we do this? Well, we took a non-traditional approach and we asked the question, what if we had intervened on the pathways participants and helped them to improve their diet quality or help them to improve their physical activity or help them not to smoke after diagnosis? Uh, what, would the, what would we expect the impact to be on all cause mortality? Now, let me just be clear that this is a hypothetical analysis. Uh, we did not actually intervene on anybody in the pathways participants, anybody in the pathways study. Uh, we only intervened on the observed data that we, that we received from participants as if we had intervened. So let me just give you an example for here. So for like diet quality, here you see that uh, we did a moderate hypothetical intervention on diet quality. And we said, basically we said, anybody who is, has a score of 46 or more can keep the, the score that they have. They do not need to be intervened on. But anyone who's under a 46, we raised their score to 46. So it was as if we had intervened and improved their diet. And then we compared that group to the same population without the hypothetical intervention. Now, we also wanted to look at different levels of intensity of, of interventions or of change. So we also uh, looked at different comparisons that raised the different levels all the way up to the most extreme of 77, which was the highest score in the pathway study. And I should just mention that each of these scores are based on the um, distribution of, um, of the index in the pathway study. And, uh, and then we did the same thing with physical activity. Um, we, we created cutoffs and for those that were under the cutoff, we raised them as if we had intervened on physical activity. For everybody who was over the cutoff, we left them as, as they were. And then smoking, we did something different. We just said made smokers quit and non-smokers never start. And here's what we found. We basically found that increasing diet quality or improving diet quality and physical activity and not smoking after diagnosis was associated with five-year risk of all-cause mortality. And what you're looking at here are risk ratios that are comparing uh, each hypothetical intervention to the same population without the intervention, so just their natural course. 
And what you can see here is when we look at the healthy plant-based diet score, as we increase the intensity of the intervention, we see that it becomes more protective, that people are in more uh, advantage around, uh, have a higher advantage uh, 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 when comparing the other uh, risks. Um, and the same goes for physical activity. When the, more, the higher the level of intensity of the intervention, the better the outcome. And smoking was also um, um, protective. The interesting thing here though, was that when we combined the different interventions together, what we found was with even the most modest interventions combined, that is combining the modest um, dietary quality intervention, the modest physical activity question, intervention with smoking, we found a 12%, uh, we observed a 12% reduced risk. And of course, uh, when we did the, the more um, extreme across the board, we found a 55% reduced risk. And now while that may seem um, you know, unattainable in terms of intervention to get people to, to, to achieve such standards, this does give you a range, a sense of the range that can be achieved or what is possible uh, if we were to intervene at different levels of these different risk factors. So let me just say in summary that yes, the quality of a person's diet seems to be important consideration for improving breast cancer prognosis. Uh, higher diet quality around the time of diagnosis was associated with a reduction in all cause and non-breast cancer specific mortality, but not so much for breast cancer specific outcomes. And that increasing diet quality after diagnosis could reduce the risk of death, especially when combined with increased physical activity and not smoking. So I leave you with this quote and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Argus. And now, um, Ichimaka, if you would please share your slides. Um, sorry, I'm doing this on just one screen. So let me know verbally, because I can't see the video if anything's wrong. <laughs> um, but yes. Um, so it, it's not see. showing your um, full slides. It's okay, just sh on. showing the, like it needs to have the play button pushed. Okay, give me one second. So sorry. Maybe if I share the window. How about now? That's it. Great. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> um, great. So yes, sorry about that. I'm Ichimaka Yannick Mogale. Um, and I am a data reporting and analytics consultant at Kaiser. And I'll be doing a quick presentation on plant-based dietary patterns and breast cancer recurrence and survival in the pathway study. So um, Isaac already explained what HPDI is, a healthy plant-based dietary index. And so I don't wanna belabor the point of re-explaining it. So I'll just jump right into discussing what does it mean to have a dietary pattern with high agreement with HPDI? That's like, what does it mean to have a high score? And so to explore that question, I started, um, I have this radar plot and this radar plot has a red line in it. And in the red line represents the median score assigned for the food group amongst the individuals with the highest overall HPDI score. So that's the individuals in the top 20% of HPDI scores. And how you can interpret this plot is as the line gets pulled towards the outside of the circle, that means there is a higher score, which means there's more consumption of that food group. And as the line is getting pulled towards the center of the circle, that means there's less consumption of that food group. And so since this is the median scores of the top 20% of people amongst the HPDI scores, what we can see here, like the pattern that gets revealed here, is that to achieve high agreement with HPDI did not require the exclusion of unhelpful plants or animals from their diet. So we can see that in the animal food groups and also in the unhelpful plants, 
the scores for all these food groups are about like two or three, which means it's part of the diet. It's just not the majority of the diet. Instead, what it requires that the majority of the diet is healthful plants, which consistently had about a median score of four across almost all of the food groups. So then we took the HPDI scores and we wanted to understand what, how does like long-term diet post-diagnosis affect breast cancer recurrence and survival outcomes. And so how we tried to conceptualize um, long-term diet was we did time-dependent cumulative average scores. And kind of simply what that means is if someone had a repeated measure, we took their, a repeated measure for their um, food scores we took their score and we like incorporated, we did like an updated average over time. And that is the way that we were able to like kind of measure long-term diet. And this is a forest plot where this vertical line is like the null. And so being having a point estimate for the hazard ratios, being on the left of the line means there's a reduced hazard and being on the right side of the line means there's an increased hazard and incorporating the line means it's insignificant. So what you can see is the only one that doesn't incorporate the line or overlap the line is non-breast cancer specific mortality, where we saw like long-term compliance with the HPDI, healthful plant-based plant -based diet, was associated with a reduced hazard of non-breast cancer mortality and was not significantly associated with the other outcomes, which was breast cancer specific mortality, all cause and recurrence. A quick conclusion. Um, Consistently sticking to a helpful plant-based diet does not require the exclusion of animal foods and unhelpful plants from your diet. Instead, it requires the majority of your diet to be helpful plants. And long-term compliance to a helpful plant-based diet post-diagnosis was associated with a reduction in non-breast cancer mortality. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ah, and already ready to go. <laughs> Please go ahead and share your slides, Dr. Yao. Sure. Can you see my slide? All right. Uh, I hope this works okay. Uh, thanks very much, Catherine, for hosting this and for having me here. I'm going to talk about uh, research we have been doing um, in the pathway study uh, on vitamin D and breast cancer uh, prognosis. Um, okay. So uh, yeah, um, so what's special about vitamin D? Because apparently it's special to me since I started to work on this since I was a PhD student. Um, but really uh, vitamin D has uh, quite uh, several special qualities. Uh, for example, uh, it's not just a vitamin, it's also a steroid. If you look at the uh, figure on the left here, and this is uh, the figure above, that's the structure, the, uh, the chemical structure of of, uh, uh, of steroid. And underneath that, this is the active form of vitamin D. So you can see apparently those two are quite similar. And, and vitamin D works as a psychosteroid that can be quite potent in regulating, changing the gene expression of a large number of genes in our genome. So it can be a quite potent uh, chemical. Uh, where we obtain vitamin D, uh, usually for a lot of vitamins, we obtain those from food but for vitamin D, we actually obtain those mainly from uh, sunlight exposure. And the, uh, the sunlight can convert the 7 dihydrocholesterol into uh, the uh, precursor uh, of, uh, of uh, vitamin D, which is, can be further uh, activated by our kidneys. And we, the, <coughs> excuse me, there's a small proportion of vitamin D we can actually obtain from the food, but from a very limited number of foods, like fish, uh, like some mushrooms. And of, apparently nowadays we can obtain those uh, readily through a uh, supplement. I'm going to come back to this uh, point a little bit later. And another quite interesting point about vitamin D is that um, it has a lot to do with our skin color and how our skin color uh, has been evolving through the uh, thousands of years of human evolution. And here uh, is the, the paper from a few years ago where it shows there's a quite uh, good uh, correlation between the sunshine exposure and the skin color. Uh, so people who live uh, close to the equator where the sun exposure is stronger, uh, the skin color tends to be darker because we want to protect uh, from the damage of the UV uh, light. 
But as you move away from equator where the sunlight is not as strong, then we need more vitamin to be synthesized under a weaker sunlight. Then the skin becomes uh, lighter and to, to be able to absorb more, uh, more sunlight to, to synthesize vitamin D. So this also tells you that vitamin D is very important physiologically. And one apparent reason is for bone health because vitamin D is very uh, important for uh, absorption of uh, calcium. And also it's very important for our bone metabolism. But other than that, other than the bone health benefits, uh, more and more data have shown that vitamin D is also uh, potentially helpful for um, cancer. So uh, before I talk about uh, the relevance of vitamin D and cancer, uh, what about uh, where do we get vitamin D? So based on the data we obtained from the pathway study, where we measured about 4,000 uh, 4, patients for their vitamin D levels at the time close to diagnosis, we look at a number of factors that are related with uh, vitamin D levels. So here shown here, the R square, you can understand this as the percentage of the um, levels of vitamin D, the difference between individuals that can be explained by those factors. So the higher the number is, the more important factor uh, to determine the vitamin, D, uh, the vitamin D levels. So apparently, um, I think there's no, no surprise vitamin D supplement use is the most important factor. But also you can see uh, coming right after that is the body mass index. This is because vitamin D is fat soluble. So that means it can be quenched by the fatty tissues in our body. So for people who have higher body mass index, their vitamin D level tend to be lower. And then race ethnicity, as I mentioned earlier, uh, because um, race is partially determined based on skin color. And then the skin color with the uh, for people with, with darker skin color, their synthesis of vitamin D and their sun exposure is compromised. And that's why they have tend to have lower vitamin D, uh, D levels. And also uh, because of sun exposure, uh, you may wonder uh, how important it is to look at, uh, to collect the blood sample for measurement. So seasonal blood collection certainly plays a role too. But so the figure on the right shows that the uh, all the 4,000 vitamin D levels we measured in patients and correlate that with the week of blood collection time across a year, so 52 weeks a year. And you can see here, because this is uh, in um, the Bay Area, where the sun exposure change across the season is not that dramatic, there may be a, a little bump around the mid-year here, the corresponding to summertime. But if you look at the picture uh, uh, here in Western New York, you see a much more dramatic changes. So the level is lower in winter and higher in uh, summer. Also based on pathway data, as we compare the vitamin D levels based on self-reported race ethnicity groups, as you can see here, uh, white patients tend to have higher levels than black patients, uh, Asian patients, and Hispanic patients. So this is consistent with what we know. So again, as I uh, alluded to before, um, there have been a lot of literature in the recent years showing vitamin D may be biologically relevant to uh, protection of breast cancer, and the mechanism can be multiple. Uh, for example, the anti-inflammatory uh, impact of, of uh, vitamin D. All immune cells actually have uh, expressed vitamin D receptors. So vitamin D is so thought to be anti-inflammatory uh, and uh, is important for uh, uh, immune regulations. And also vitamin D is shown to be involved in antioxidant and indemnity repair and involved in cell apoptosis, which really is a program cell death. And, and then uh, for or differentiation of cell cycles. So here is really the, the, the major picture, um, the major uh, funding we have had uh, from a few years ago that published in 2017, where we, at that time we have data up to 2013. We measure not all the patients we have back then, but about half of the patients in pathways and the follow-up time about seven years where we see some separation of the uh, survival probabilities for the patient based on their vitamin D levels. So you can see here, the darker blue is a, a patient who have relatively low vitamin D and they tend to have the worst uh, survival. And very happily, after about seven years, we recently updated those outcomes. Now we, uh, we did the study in a much larger, in almost all the, in all the puzzle samples we have blood samples on and which uh, much longer follow-up time now more than 10 years. And uh, the results hold up. And also you can see the separation of the three lines based on the sufficient, insufficient, deficient uh, 
quantum levels separate even better uh, than we have previously than we have previously seen. And here are the results to summarize the the uh, the previous figure where you can see here the uh, pa patient with sufficient vitamin D levels and have about 32% of lower risk of death uh, than in comparison to patients who have uh, deficient vitamin, uh, vitamin D levels. And for epidemiologists, we always want to uh, justify to control for the confounding factors of what we saw might not relate to the with vitamin D, but something else, we want to make sure the associations we found are real. So we tried a number of those factors with diff well, different models. And at the end, you can see here, this association is about 0.78. So that has a ratio that means vitamin D, higher vitamin D level is associated with about 22% of lower risk of deaths after counting everything else. And this is still considered statistically significant. So we are, uh, we are very happy that our results remained and stayed uh, about the same after uh, we expand the study and also uh, extend the study for a long, much longer time. Also, another piece of very interesting finding we have from this uh, study is that we found that vitamin D levels tend to be lower in patients with a more advanced uh, stage uh, diagnosis. So this is stage one, stage two, and stage three and four combined. As you can see here, as uh, people have in patients with um, in patients with small advanced cancer diagnosis, the level tend to be lower. And when we stratify the analysis by the cancer stage, and again, comparing patients with sufficient, with deficient vitamin D levels, and the association appeared to be most strong in patients with advanced cancer uh, stage. So this tells us that uh, vitamin D levels may be particularly relevant to patients diagnosed with uh, advanced can uh, breast cancer and the P interaction is also highly significant. So put uh, our results uh, in the context of the literature where the literature has shown. So this figure shows uh, is from a large, the largest vitamin D supplementation trial uh, published on in the Journal of Medicine back in 20, uh, 2019, where it shows that uh, the vitamin D supplementation uh, had, was associated with uh, lower risk of death from cancer, although this is not statistic, uh, statistically significant, but if you remove the deaths uh, from the first two years of follow-up, and then they become statistically significant, about a quarter lower deaths of um, patients who take vitamin D supplement, supplementation than those who do not. And this is another study uh, from the same year which did a meta-analysis uh, which basically put all the uh, literatures together. All those, uh, I think those studies are all the randomization, the randomized trials on vitamin D. And they also confirmed that the vitamin D supplementation reduced the death of cancer uh, from cancer. And at the same time, if you can look at the um, results on the cardiovascular mortality, so people died from a heart attack, for example, the, the decrease was not significant. Another thing to um, mention is that uh, a majority of the patients actually at the time of breast cancer diagnosis were either vitamin D insufficient or vitamin D deficient. As shown here, this is from the pathway study in, um, in the Bay Area. About 38% of patients were determined to be vitamin D deficient at the, time of, at the time of diagnosis. But if you look at the data from another study, this is from a New York City, where you can see at baseline, the time of breast cancer diagnosis, the percentage about 70%. So they're much, much higher. So the vitamin D deficiency can be a very prevalent problem uh, in among patients with breast cancer. But the good news is that with vitamin D supplementation, you can actually um, improve the vitamin D deficiency. You can see uh, the percentage, the, pre the proportion of patients with the vitamin D deficiency, which is a uh, blue color here, actually decreased. But then that decrease is not the same uh, by different racial ethnic groups. For example, the decrease is quite um, apparent in white patients, but then uh, in Hispanic patients is uh, is about as effective, but it's less effective in black patients. Another thing to consider is that the obesity. I, I mentioned this earlier uh, because vitamin D is uh, fat soluble. So in patients with higher BMI, uh, the uh, vitamin D level tend to be lower. This study just came out uh, last week, I believe, um, from the vital trials. 
where they give uh, vitamin D supplementation to patients and then measure the vitamin D level before and after the supplementation. So at baseline and about as in the second year. And as, as you can see here, by different uh, BMI uh, groups, so this from uh, normal underweight to uh, normal weight to overweight to, to obese. And you can see here the increase of the vitamin D uh, for, from the supplementation is decreased. So that means people with higher BMI tend to benefit less from the same dose of vitamin D supplementation. Whether the patients need, those patients need higher dose of vitamin D supplementation, currently we don't know the answer because there are no good data on that, but I think that's a rationale um, uh, approach and need to be tested in, uh, next. So in conclusion, a substantial proportion of women uh, were vitamin D deficient or insufficient at the time of breast cancer, di uh, breast cancer diagnosis and maintaining sufficient vitamin D levels after breast cancer diagnosis is advisable for better prognosis, especially based on our data, we show that uh, it may be particularly important for patients with advanced uh, stage disease. And supplement, uh, vitamin D supplementation is a safe and effective way to increase vitamin D levels, and patients with higher BMI may need a higher dose. So the current uh, recommendation from the Institute of, uh, Institute of Medicine recommends 600 IU for all age up to 70 and 800 IU for age 71 and older. And this level is made mainly for bone health. And um, the IOM recommends that there's not sufficient data yet for health beyond bone health. So that's why they, they maintain this level relatively low. But uh, there have been a lot of comments and uh, we provide some link for those readings um, for whether we should uh, uh, update that for a higher level or not. Uh, that's still up to, uh, to debate. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Song. Dr. Yao. Um, now, while our panelists are all turning their cameras back on, I'd also like to invite our uh, two participants in the Pathway Study who are currently members of our Community Advisory Board and um, to join us as panelists as well. Um, they will be asking a couple of questions first before we open it up to the larger group as for the Q&A, um, including ones that you've been entering into the, oh, there's Paula, good, we've got one already, yay. Um, so Paula Coombs was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2012. She has been on the Pathways CAB, the Community Advisory Board, since it was started. Um, thank you very much for joining us, Paula. I know that um, Maria Sierra Bell is also um, was on. Yay, there's Paula joining us from Portugal, formerly of Sacramento. Um, so, um, pa uh, Paula, do you want to go ahead and um, ask a question of our panelists? Yes, I have actually a few questions. I was especially interested in the discussion on vitamin D. So, what you said the recommended dosage would be for somebody over 70 would be 800 IU. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Is it is it higher for women or is the vitamin D dosage different for men? And is it higher for women with breast cancer specifically? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks for those questions. Um, and thanks for participating in the Pathways study. Um, the IOM recommendation um, does not differentiate between men and women. And uh, there has been, um, as far as I know, no um, gender differences in, in the metabolism or the utility of vitamin D. Um, but for the, uh, again, the IOM recommendation is for bone health. And uh, there has been no consensus uh, what should be the uh, recommendation for um, health benefits for breast cancer um, prognosis. So we currently don't know. Uh, and for safety reason, we still recommend to stick with the uh, 800 IU for patients 70 years or older and 600 IU daily for patients uh, under 70 years. So is there a, can you get too much? 
so taking supplements if you are out in the sunshine on a regular basis, mm -hmm. plus you take a supplement, could you possibly get too much vitamin D? Um, no, not really. Um, so uh, the, the body is very smart. Our body is very smart. We can we we, we can ensure if we expose if we are exposed to sunlight for a long time, uh, the vitamin D synthesis pathway will be shut down. So there's uh, we, we will not be able to get our vitamin D level to as high as that pointedness to us. But at the mm -hmm. same time, if we Vitamin D supplementation can do that. So we certainly don't want to uh, take too much vitamin D supplementation. So the current IOM recommendation for the upper dose of vitamin D supplementation is 4,000 IU per day. So if you go above that, you start to see some toxicities like hypercalcemia, uh, the calcium level being too high, and there may be kidney stones formed. So was that 4,000 4, stone? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Was, that, was that 4,000, did you say? Yeah, 4,000 IU. Four per day. Okay. So then there isn't, so for women who um, had certain treatments like AI or mm -hmm. um, yeah. AI inhibitors, there isn't any difference then as far as the vitamin D um, that they would be taking compared to somebody that not had those types of treatments? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, definitely. I think there the vitamin D uh, can potentially be beneficial for not breast cancer prognosis, but also for bone health. So we know aromatase inhibitors um, cause a low, very low level of estrogen, and then, then that, that's, that's needed for bone health. So for those patients, uh, there might be a need for higher vitamin D supplementation dose, but again, there's no sufficient data for us to make any recommendation, uh, like what level should that be? So that seems to do a lot of work are needed. Okay. Um, that was my vitamin D question. That I had. <laughs> Thank you. I do have some other questions, but I, I I'll let somebody else maybe go. <laughs> it looks like we have Maria on too. Hi, Maria. Welcome. Hi. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. No, my question. Pretty much, um, Paula um asked the questions that I was interested in vitamin D. Um, the only thing I think I needed clarification is on the skin tone color. W am I correct in understanding that um, the, the darker the pig pigmentation, the less vitamin D your body absorbs? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, um, you're right. Uh, oh. the dark, so for people with darker skin, um, our uh, absorption of the UV light is uh, lower. Uh, and then because of that, the vitamin D synthesis ethic, uh, efficiency is lower. So people with darker, co uh, darker color in North America tend to have lower vitamin D levels than those with uh, light, uh, lighter skin color. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll say that's more of an issue in Buffalo, New York than in <laughs> the San Francisco <laughs> Bay Area. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, I do have another vitamin D question, sure. sorry. So um, I know there's so many different types of vitamins out there. When you go to the store, you see so much on the mm -hmm. shelf. Are there different forms or better forms to take? And people who have a hard time taking vitamin D yeah. in the pill form, is there a liquid or something? Um, so... For chemical uh, structures, there are mainly two forms of vitamin D supplementation you can buy. One vitamin D, D2 and one D3. So uh, usually D3 is preferred than D2 for better bioavailability. Um, but I'm not sure if there has been a liquid form. Probably there is. There is. I'm not um, entirely familiar with that. Sorry. Yeah. I don't know. Oil, for example. It's a okay. Yeah. That's yeah. that's what I take. I take the liquid form. Yeah, they're coming like little little gel capsules. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I, I do have a question in regards to diet. Um, oh, I, were you finished with that question, um, Paula? Well, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I think so. The, you talked about vitamin D being absorbed, though. Do you need to take something? Um, additional so that you can ensure that the vitamin D is absorbed properly? 
Um, the, the absorption of vitamin D is really, um, has not been an issue uh, for most people. So uh, if we take supplementation, the, the, the absorption is, is, is really sufficient. Okay. So uh, I, I'm not sure if uh, there's any method, uh, need to uh, take something else to improve that uh, absorption. Does that, uh, does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Yeah, vitamin D has been on um, a big discussion point in our group. So thank you very much. Sorry, Maria. Oh, sure. Go thank ahead. You. <laughs> okay. Thank you for you. making this research possible. I, okay. I, my question is, is in regards to diet. Was, um, especially the Mediterranean diet, um, when you showed the graphs, was I, did I understand this correctly, that the Mediterranean diet was, had the worst outcome? So uh, let me start by saying that each of the dietary indices did show um, protective effects. Okay. So, but what I did want to point out is kind of which ones were the standouts among them, right? Okay. So, um, you know, when we looked at that particular graph that you're referring to, it looked like the um, American Cancer Society nutrition guidelines, what, you know, had the strongest associations with all-cause mortality. And, um, you know, um, yeah, so, you know, that was really the, the kind of the main point there. And it was also the one that was, you know, that was uh, the only one out of those that were statistically significant. The other thing about the Mediterranean diet too was that it was the one out of the out of the four indices that we looked at that also did not have um, sort of like a dose response kind of um, relationship with the outcome. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, you, you know, you'd expect the closer you are, the more similar you are with the diet, the better your outcome would be in this kind of like ideally in some sort of kind of linear way, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but the Mediterranean diet was one that did not, uh, did not show that out of those, out of those four. Mm -hmm. um, so those were the kind of the two points I was making about the Mediterranean diet. So when you say all causes, I mean, um, that means you can die from anything. That's correct. Okay. Any, any, yes, that's right. <laughs> and, um, and as I, and as I mentioned there too, you know, when we looked at just non-breast cancer specific death. So deaths not due to breast cancer. It looked like DASH was kind of the standout dietary pattern in that group, in which I which I think is really interesting because when you think about the non-breast cancer deaths, um, you, you can assume that the majority of those are probably, or a great deal of many of those are due to other diseases such as cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. And so these, uh, you know, to see the DASH diet perform so well there uh, makes sense because, you know, if people are dying from cardiovascular disease, the DASH diet was designed specifically to combat, you know, to, to treat hypertension and heart disease. And this, I think, is really important to know for breast cancer survivors because there's mounting evidence that breast cancer survivors are at increased risk of heart disease. Um, you know, compared to those with, um, that are not breast cancer survivors. And that's a study that's currently going on uh, in the pathway study that, you know, we're looking at heart disease within breast cancer survivors. And um, my next analysis is looking at these dietary patterns specifically with cardiovascular uh, disease outcomes. And we are already seeing, you know, how the DASH diet is really a standout um, among the different, different groups. Well, if, if I can follow up on that, actually, um, Paula, you had a heart attack last year. And um, did your doctors or nurses recommend any changes to your diets or to supplements? And was that, were there any, was there anything different from what they had recommended around your breast cancer, um, what they had recommended around breast cancer? It's very, very similar because, you know, the recommendations as far as breast cancer is to eat more healthy, et cetera. But after my heart attack, it's much more specific, definitely more of a plant-based diet, um, avoiding fat, losing weight, et cetera. And I think after, you know, with these health issues that we have, and um, for me in particular, as I age, um, because I'm on the older side of the study, it, you become more aware 
of um, how your habits and um, affect your health. And as a result of being part of this study and having the privilege of hearing all of these wonderful studies that you all are doing, it does make those of us that um, are able to hear this information take it a little more seriously and actually pay attention. So yes, they they did recommend a more improved diet as far as plant-based and eliminating um, more fat and sugar, of course. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I did have a question, a follow-up question with that too. Um, what are some of the specific foods that we should avoid? And what are some of the specific foods that we could eat more of? Yeah, I think it's a great question because ultimately that's what everybody wants to know. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, this just to kind of be clear, you know, this particular analysis didn't really, you know, target specific foods. However, we were looking at kind of, you know, patterns. But that said, we can look at these patterns and we could say, you know, what kinds of foods are they encouraging and what kinds of foods are they discouraging? And so to me, kind of as I alluded to already, you know, the kind of the standout indices to me when I, you know, look at, you know, I've looked at these patterns and so many different ways at this point, but the standout patterns to me look like, you know, the American Cancer Society, DASH diet, as well as the Healthy Plant-Based Dietary Index. Each of those seem to have kind of the strongest associations when I look at different outcomes, especially our non-breast cancer outcomes. Um, and so, you know, we could look across those indices and, you know, I, I think we could kind of, you know, take advantage of all of them, right? And so we could look at what what you know? What what do they have in common, and what are some of the differences, and how can we take advantage of those differences? So, you know, if we look at those three, we can say, well, they all really encourage eating lots of fruits and vegetables. You know, surprise, surprise. So, um, you know, and where the ACS also really encourages, as I mentioned before, a variety of fruits and vegetables. So, you know, try to get you know lots of different types of colors and different types of vegetables into your diet. Um, and then, um, sorry, I just. Okay, and then, um, you know, what else do they have in common? Well, you know, they, they each discourage, eat, you know, eating a lot of processed meat. And I think processed meat has, you know, become pretty, you know, there's been a lot of strong evidence around uh, not, you know, limiting processed meat, if eating it at, at all. And what I'm talking about is things like anything that's kind of been smoked, like sausages or bacon or um, mm -hmm. any of those salamis, dried, any of those kinds of meats that have been processed in some way, there is, you know, a lot of evidence to suggest that it is, you know, a carcinogen, um, you know, uh, WHO has already classified it as a class one carcinogen. Um, and then the same goes with, you know, red meat. Maybe there's not as much evidence there, but there is a mounting evidence to suggest that red meat, uh, you know, is, is, you know, is, is, is dangerous. And so, um, you know, I certainly, if you're, if you're, you know, determined to eat red meat, you know, you're going to want to limit your consumption of red meat. Uh, but then other, you know, types of foods that I've seen kind of when looking more closely at these patterns, like what, what food groups tend to drive these associations? Um, you know, some of the standouts are, are nuts and legumes are two food groups that seem to, kind of cross over different um, dietary uh, indices to suggest a protective effect. So eating more fruit, more legumes, more nuts uh, seems to be, uh, show some protective signs. So, um, you know, so, you know, we can, you can look at, and there's links to each of these indices, uh, I believe were posted in the chat. So you could look at, you know, those three, if you want, and, you know, compare them a little bit, see what makes sense, because diet is so personal, you know, it's like, Everybody, you know, we could suggest all these different things, but it also has to fit with the person, right? So, you know, look at these different indices and, you know, see how you can take advantage of them. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Maria, I know you had a question and Pat, I see that oh. we have you on now too. Yeah, my question was, um, why are we higher at risk for um, heart attack? Is it because of the radiation? Is it because of the chemotherapy that um, damaged us? 
<laughs> oh yes that was yeah that was our last um newsletter article and our survivorship fact sheet it was it is those things the both of those things and the stress also of the diagnosis mm -hmm. and um also with age and it's one of those things um that you know it's actually quite common among women that we just don't necessarily recognize Okay. We may want to uh, post a link to the Pathways Heart Study paper at some point. Um, oh, great. Yeah, if you can that share that with Liana, she can post yeah. that. Mm -hmm. um, and there was also a question about um, sugar. And Ijimaka, I know that there was one also in the um, Q&A earlier. Um, and there was one about sugar sweetened beverages. Um, is is sugar or Larry or whomever is sugar um, a problem? Um, I I'm happy to take a stab at it. Um, and it, you know, sugar is discouraged by the guideline. You know, if you look at the guidelines, the ACS guidelines, or you know, um, it, it's it's certainly discouraged. Uh, you know, for for protection against cancer. Um, I don't know that we have specific, and I don't know that we've specifically looked at sugar yet in the pathway study, though I can tell you that the DASH diet uh, does discourage, specifically discourages sugar and sweets, as does the healthy plant-based dietary index, both discourage sugar consumption. So, and as far as that goes, um, you know, between the guidelines and what we've seen in pathways so far, um, you know, certainly I would think you'd want to limit it, but maybe others, Larry, I know you maybe want to yeah. add. <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, so I'll just say that uh, the role of sugar on, on cancer risk or prognosis as recommended by, say, the American Cancer Society or the World Cancer Research Fund, as Isaac said, is to limit intake uh, what, and sugar-sweetened beverages, for example, also limiting intake. Uh, it's, it's less a direct effect and more because of the strong relationship with obesity or fat deposition, I guess, excess fat tissue, which is itself, you know, related to development of, of uh, certainly, uh, and has a more complicated relationship with, uh, you know, after your diagnosis with diagnosed with cancer, you know, but basically that's the, the primary basis for those recommendations. Uh, yeah, it seems like it's, what generally about you know, inflammation what larry what about yeah inflammation? i mean that that there's less you know sort of direct evidence related to that pathway so so to speak you know but uh you know but there are other reasons you know that that could be recommended uh so uh or you know limiting intake of sugar, sugar and sugar sweetened beverages in particular uh which is a pretty easy way of consuming a lot of sugar without realizing that you're doing so Yeah. I know that we've had a number of questions about what's in a good diet. I do want to share, actually, our last webinar was about um, um, and there's a couple of our Pathways um, CAB members, community advisors. Let me go ahead and show this. Oops, sorry, went back to the beginning. This is um, from the last webinar that we had where we shared a healthy plate and um, it was the, um, we were talking about cardiovascular disease and breast cancer both. So this was um, from, a, a cardiovascular surgeon who worked specifically with people who had had breast cancer um, down at South San, um, South San Francisco. Um, so just as an example, and I really liked what you said, Isaac, about the colorful, because I think that's a nice, easy way for many of us to kind of get our heads around uh, the idea of, you know, of a variety. Um, 
And legumes and pulses are one of those things that I think sometimes in American diets are not as obvious, maybe. Um, I don't know, is that, are they more common in um, other places? Paula, do you see more of, in Portugal, do you see people eating more legumes? I can't hear yes. you. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, there you are. Oh, am I there now? Okay. So I see more fish rather than beans, actually, um, or legumes, but, and more vegetables just in general. But the Mediterranean diet, I do think that the one thing the Mediterranean diet probably has that puts it up there, uh, may maybe where it's not as good as the DASH diet is the amount of olive oil that they do seem to use in um, the Mediterranean countries. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Nuts and seeds too, I think are another thing yes. that are listed on here. Yeah, and they, they, you know, I do see a lot of nuts and seeds in the, in the cooking here, nuts in particular, but um, the, the, a lot of fish, not as much beef, for sure. So, um, Pat, I don't know if you are able to, to talk with us. Um, we seem to still have you muted, but I know that there was a question about soy and um, whether or not soy eating um, soy foods is a problem. And Larry, I think I've heard you talk about this one before. Um, soy foods versus soy. Oh, there's Patricia. Okay. There's Pat. Yeah. About see that. You know, I do have a question, and I'll tell you, it takes me back to 2007 when I had my breast cancer. When I had my breast cancer, I, no one told me anything about nutrition or or uh, or vitamin D at that time, and I wasn't taking that. So I, my question is, do you think oncologists, because we know diet, we know vitamin D is important, and some of us have been lucky enough to defi to find that out. Is there any way oncologists can take uh, send their patients to a nutritionist or on the right path when it comes to diet? Yeah, I wonder if our doctors could, you know, could you know? I think because I would say me was going to a nutritionist. That's a good point, Pat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so I guess I can't really speak for the Kaiser clinical you know, operations, you know, and clinical workflow per se, you know, but I think that there is generally growing awareness that, you know, sort of your food choices, etc., you know, can make a difference. Uh, Great, uh, good. And so what is actually happening in practice? I don't, I don't know specifically, but perhaps we can find out some information about that and just generally, you know, in a follow up to this forum, you know a little bit of sort of general information anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know that we've talked with yeah, the breast care coordinators. Girl, you know, baby poor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the breast care coordinators have talked about that. Mm -hmm. And that is something that they are um, really working to make sure that people get um, information on. So um, I believe that is something that is, um, is now much, much more um, important. Uh, um, in, in receiving a lot more awareness. And there's also a follow-up study that is being done in Sacramento, isn't there, Larry, with... Um... Yeah, South Sacramento, uh, yeah, at where there's a, basically a pilot project, in a sense a pilot project, but a, a, it's an actual clinical program that's available for uh, people with breast cancer to help people make dietary change, et cetera, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Larry. Yeah. And um, so back to the soy question. Yeah, so getting just first the more generic question about legumes in general, uh, you know, or, uh, and uh, I noticed uh, at least there was a partial, 
there was a response that yes, you know, legumes and beans are generally low intake in the U.S. population, generally speaking. Uh, the sub subgroups that tend to have higher intake uh, tend to be uh, Hispanics, uh, particularly, and and Asians, particularly if they're more tied to their traditional uh, food ways. Uh, and of course, soy and soybeans in particular, you know, are lots of different soy foods are popular in East Asian cuisine. So, uh, and so the relationship with breast cancer uh, is uh, there. There was there continues to be this what I would say largely a misconception that soy foods may be problematic for both developing breast cancer and for people with hormone receptor positive breast cancers. And there's a strong basis for that. Basically, if you take uh, breast cancer cells, put them in tissue culture, expose them to these compounds, these phytoestrogens or isoflavones that soy foods are particularly rich in, then they will proliferate. And so, mm -hmm. So, but whether that's the case in uh, in the real world, so to speak, rather than in a you know petri dish, uh, is a question. And so, uh, there have been a, a few studies now that have been published in women with breast cancer that basically indicate that eat more soy foods, have or report eating more soy foods, actually do uh, better. Uh, than women who do not, regardless of receptor status, uh, whether you're home receptor positive or not. Um, now, one might say, well, maybe they would have done even better if you know if if they had less uh, soy foods. But uh, uh, in any case, that's the case. We haven't explicitly looked at that yet in the pathway study, although that's certainly a question that we want to look at um, in the data that uh, <clears throat> Isaac and uh, Ichiyamaka showed. Uh, with the different food groups, uh, if you look at some of the individual food groups, which is not reported directly in their papers, then uh, then legumes as a group, which may include soy foods among the Asians, etc., actually show an, a more beneficial effect uh, if you have some regular consumption of those. So that suggests that when we look at soy foods specifically, that we're probably going to see the same kind of thing, although uh, we haven't done that yet. So, and what about dairy foods? We've had a couple of questions <clears throat> about dairy products. Yeah. yeah, so again, we haven't explicitly looked at dairy per se yet in the pathway study, but we but these questions clearly make it clear that we should be looking at some of these things individually. <laughs> uh, so, and dairy foods are uh, looked at a, a fair amount in the development of cancer and in uh, the uh, and in breast cancer, people with breast cancer and breast cancer survivors. And currently, the evidence in breast cancer survivors, like the pathway study, where we haven't looked at it yet, as I mentioned, is mixed. Basically, it doesn't seem to have much of a major impact one way or another, but we probably need to look at it in more detail. And we certainly should look at it specifically in um, the uh, pathway study. On the cancer prevention side, I'll just say that the evidence seems to be pretty strong, consistent across studies that dairy food increases the likelihood of developing prostate cancer, which of course, very different cancer, uh, but also hormone related. Uh, and also is consistently shown to lower the likelihood of developing colorectal cancer. You know, so, so it's kind of mixed. You know, both of those are relatively common cancers. You know, overall, uh, and certainly in men, prostate cancer is among the most common uh, cancers. So, uh, so the American Cancer Society. Uh, I've served on the committee that develops these cancer prevention guidelines, as well as the uh, cancer survivorship guidelines. Have generally not made an overall cancer recommendation. Uh, because it seems to have these differing effects on these major things. Uh, and so there's, it's difficult to make an overall recommendation of, on the cancer prevention side. Right. Yeah, one thing I will say, uh, which is of potential interest, uh, is that there's one of the big studies, sorry, I guess we're getting towards the end of the hour, but one of, one of the 
big studies that really improved our uh, knowledge about diet and health is the nurse's health study from that's run out of Harvard, prospective study of 100,000 women with diet information, and the nurse's health study too, and some of their other large cohort studies. And, uh, and some of the early analyses in the nurse's health study suggest there really wasn't much of a dairy impact on breast cancer risk, but the nurse's health study too suggests that there might be uh, mm. something to do with changes in the way the dairy industry has uh, uh, basically milked cows. Uh, <clears throat> and part of that is that what the dairy industry does now, large, generally speaking, uh, and this varies, you know, by, you know, by the actual dairy farm, but generally speaking, dairy cows are milked white while they're they're pregnant. So normally, if you're a mammal and you're giving breast milk uh, for your child, you know, for your you know calf or whatever, if you're a cow, uh, uh, usually that helps to prevent pregnancies, right? Uh, it's not 100% absolute, but it does help to prevent that. And uh, but in the dairy industry, the the dairy cows are artificially inseminated while they're uh, being milked, uh, partly so that the time period between when the cows are don't give milk uh, is minimized. Okay, and as anyone who who studied sort of pregnancy related biology, estrogen levels go dramatically increase dramatically during pregnancy. You know, so so if you have milk from cows that have been uh, uh, that are pregnant while they're being milked, then the estrogen levels in the milk are going to be much higher than if you weren't pregnant. Uh, so, uh, so whether that has an impact on health, who knows? You know, but uh, in any case, that's an interesting sort of observation. Right. It's so much, so much more still to mm -hmm. to find out about, and for us to actually do continue to discuss. So. Um, thank you so much to our speakers, our CAB members, and to um, all the folks who asked so many great questions. We will be following up, answering questions in a blog, and so everyone who registered will receive a link to the recording of today's webinar, as well as with a, a link to the blog that will have answers to the questions that we did not get to, at least as many as we're able to. Um, you will also receive a survey. Please fill it out. Let us know what you think went well, what we can improve, and what topics you would like to hear about in the future. Our next webinar is going to be in September. And um, if you are not already on our mailing list, um, please sign up for our not too frequent emails from Zero Breast Cancer. And we also would welcome you to join us on social media um, to hear about our English and Spanish language campaigns to on living better and longer with breast cancer after a breast cancer diagnosis, and also about our multilingual campaigns on reducing the risk of breast cancer in future generations from childhood on. Thank you everyone so much for being here today. Take care.